This is the first part of the text of Aristotle called De Interpretatione. And there are three topics covered in this material. So first of all, Aristotle's approach to philosophy is very important here. And he takes a careful look at language, how we use our language. And then what he does in, after that is he identifies how different sentences sentences connect to one another, logically speaking. So he creates what is called the traditional square of opposition for logical principles. So how sentences relate to one another. He is laying down some of the foundations for logical principles that, in fact, are still in effect today in many ways. The third thing that he does is he, once he uses those connections between sentences and statements in our language, he realizes that there is a problem related to future contingents, things that may or may not happen. And this has to do with our own freedom, freedom of the will. It has to do with whether or not things are fated for our future. And we'll cover that in part two. So first of all, language, he just starts with the very basic ideas. What, what's going on when we have language? And he says, spoken sounds are symbols of the affections of the soul. So let's think about that. What are the affections of the soul? Well, uh, they are what we, what we experience in the world. And then we symbolize them with sounds and then written marks then in turn are symbols of the spoken sounds. So as you're looking at the screen and you see the second quotation and it starts with that W-R-I-T-T-E-N, isn't it interesting that just the way the lines are written there with the straight or the curves or the dot and the I, that we see that and we instantly have this recognition of a sound written, the word written. And that in turn is symbolizing something that we understand in our mind, a word written. So Aristotle contemplates these things and he recognizes that there are two main components to our language. There are names, which are subjects in sentences, and then there are verbs, which are predicates in sentences. And on, a, on their own, these individual things have no truth value. So for example, cat is a name or a subject, and it doesn't have any truth value on its own. It's not true or false. Black is not the kind of thing that is true or false. But when you put them together and you have the statement, the cat is black, that's a sentence that can be true or false. So we have names that are subjects, verbs that are predicates, and for names, the parts don't signify anything. Unless it's a complex name like artifact, and the part art, the first part there, has a meaning similar to the name, the word art, so that can happen, but otherwise, the names, the, the parts of the name don't symbolize anything. But you could stick a not in front of it, so not man, uh, that could be called an indefinite name because it doesn't specify what you're talking about, it just specifies what you're not talking about. Verbs or predicates, though, are signs, and these can be said of something or said in something, and that distinction is made clear in the work, the categories. You could also have indefinite ideas uh, with verbs like does not recover, but a verb set alone with no context signifies something, but in a very limited way. So recover, yeah, that signifies something, but it's a very limited way because we don't know what we're talking about. What is it that recovers? Okay, so assume we have sub subjects and predicates, so we're talking about sentences now. Sentences that can be true or false are statements. So I've, I've kind of interchanged those two things up to this point. Sentences is actually more broader category than statements. Statements can 
always be true or false. They're, the, they're those kinds of things. But some sentences, like imperatives, so go shut the door, or supplications, please shut the window, and questions, did you shut the door? These things are not statements. They're not the kinds of things that can be true or false. And he also notes that some names are universals. That is, they can be said of more than one thing. So, for example, the name man, it can apply to several different things. Whereas there are specific names, particular names, that don't apply to more than one thing. Callius. Now, yes, we can use a na different name. So there are multiple people named Greg, for example. But when we're talking and we use the word Greg, we usually are specifying a particular individual when we're doing that. So with universals or particulars, we can make two different kinds of sentences. Those of particulars and those of universals. And there can be subdivided again into affirmations, positive statements about what is the case, and negations. And so we have four different kinds of sentences now. And we can classify these in order to use our traditional square of opposition. And it's just a tradition and logic that we use vowels to symbolize these different sentences. So an A sentence is a universal affirmation. So we say something like every S, S for subject, is P, P for predicate. Every S is P. And then an example of that sentence structure would be every snake is a reptile. So that would be a universal affirmation. Now, you could say this slightly differently by saying all, and then you have a, a plural name. So all snakes are reptiles. That's logically equivalent to saying every snake is a reptile. An E sentence is also a universal, but it's a negation. So we'd say no S is P, using our same name, snake. We say no snake is a mammal. Keep the sentence true. And then we have I sentences. These are constructed with specific particular names. So particular affirmations would be the I sentence where we're affirming something. Some S is P, some snake is green. Or an O sentence with the negation of a particular. So we have the sentence structure, some S is not P. And the example here, some snake is not green. So those are four different kinds of sentences that we can construct using either universals or particulars and making an affirmation or a negation. Now these have logical relationships to one another and they can be symbolized with this square. Now don't worry, I'm going to repeat this square after we talk through different connections between the types of sentences we've just discussed, the A, E, I, and O sentences. And so notice we have contraries across the top, subcontraries across the bottom. We have contradictions that are going diagonal. And then we have subalterns or subalternation, which is going downward on the sides. Okay, so here are our principles. First of all, contraries. This is a relationship that exists between A sentences and E sentences. They are contrary to one another. So it doesn't matter what the subject is or what the predicate is, if you're constructing an A sentence and an E sentence, they are contrary, which means they cannot both be true. Now it's possible that they could both be false, Commonly, you would have one true and one false, but it's possible they're both false. What you cannot ever have is an A sentence and an E sentence both being true when they're using the same subject and predicate. So if we said every man is pale, that's an affirmation. And no man is pale, that's the 
E sentence, the universal negation, we have a situation where they're both false. Right? Both of those statements are false. That's possible, right? To have an affirmation be true, the A sentence, we have every soccer player is an athlete. Now, since that's true, we know the E sentence has to be false. No soccer player is an athlete is false. And just to fill out the other possibility here, if we had every frog can talk, the universal affirmation, the A sentence, well, that's false. What about the E sentence? No frog can talk. Well, that is true. Apologies to Kermit. Sorry, not a real frog. That's not what we're talking about. Okay, so right across the top, the contraries, if the A sentence is true, the E sentence has to be false. If the E sentence is true, the A sentence has to be false. They cannot both be true, but they could both be false. Okay, so second principle, contradiction. This is the relationship that occurs in the diagonals. So we have the A and the O sentences, they are contradictory, and the E and the I sentences are contradictory. So a couple examples here, reminder what contradictory means. If one is false, the other has to be true. If one is true, the other has to be false. That's the relationship between the A and the O sentence, and it's also the relationship between the E and the I sentence. So if we said every shark is aquatic, that's an A sentence, that is true. So we know the O sentence constructed with the same subject and predicate has to be false. So some shark is not aquatic is false. Reminder, right? We're talking the A, the upper left hand, the O, the lower right hand. If one is false, the other's true. Right? And it's always the case that one is false and one is true. Okay, principle three. The I sentence and the O sentence are subcontraries, the ones on the bottom, the ones about particulars. They cannot both be false, but they could both be true. So we're ruling out something different than we did with contraries. These are subcontraries. They could both be true, but what they cannot ever be is both false. So some man is not pale and some man is pale. They're both true. So that fits. Some bat is a mammal, the I sentence. That's true. Some bat is not a mammal, false. So that's okay, as long as they're both not false. Some eagle is a mammal, the I sentence is false. Well, we know then if that's false, the O sentence has to be true with the same subject and predicate. So some eagle is not a mammal, that's true. There is a particular eagle that is not a mammal, that of course is true. So again, we're looking at, at that relationship across the bottom, the I sentence and the O sentence, they both cannot be false. So that's a third relationship between these sentences. Now, Finally, uh, what Aristotle doesn't discuss quite as clearly here in the De Interpretatione is the relationship of subalternation, and those are the ones on the sides. So we have the A sentence at the top implies that the I sentence is true. The E sentence at the top, if it's true, it implies the O sentence is also true. So if these are only relevant when you have a true A sentence or if you have a true E sentence, then you can draw an implication from those. So for example, let's take the A sentence, every fish is a swimmer. Well, that's true. So we can conclude from that, that some fish is a swimmer, okay? Consider an E sentence, no parrot is a swimmer. Let's assume that's true. And that implies that some parrot is not a swimmer. 
Now, we've called this the traditional square of opposition. Let's show it one more time. This is traditional because it makes an assumption that modern squares of opposition don't necessarily make, and this is relevant for the subalternation relationship. That assumption is that we actually have things that exist that we're talking about. So if we're talking about eagles, eagles exist. So if we say every eagle can fly, that means some eagle can fly. If we're, not, if we're talking about unicorns, and we say something like every unicorn has a horn, well, we're talking about something that doesn't exist. So that won't imply that there is a unicorn that has a horn, right? It doesn't work if the, we're talking about things that don't exist. So it's just assumed that we're only talking about things that exist. And when we assume that, those subalternation relationship works. And in every case, it doesn't matter if things exist or not, the contrary, the subcontrary, and then the contradictory relationships, those always work. Right? Those are legitimate no matter what we assume. So we will follow up on the third portion of De Interpretatione in part two.